Hey there. Um, I did a video on this a little earlier, but I deleted it. I felt like it was too long. I want to share a few things from my testimony. Um, there are believers who are... Uh, there are people who believe that Jesus is the Son of God, but deny his work, right? And I would say that that falls under the category of James saying, you believe that God is one, meaning you believe Jesus is Lord and God, but the demons believe that and they tremble. It is the belief in the work of Christ that really is the testimony. I mean, even Cain and Abel, you know, Cain believed in God and and God's promise concerning the seed and uh, that God's promise was true and that God required an offering and so he dug in the ground and gave him his works you know so that is not the saving faith the blood is the qualifier and the blood is represented with the death and resurrection of Christ because the blood represents what he shed for our sins and the blood wasn't presented until he resurrected as our high priest and ascended to heavens and sprinkled it on the mercy seat. So if you say the blood, faith in the blood, you're talking about the death and resurrection of Christ. Someone came at me one time, I did a video about the blood, and they said, no, it's the death and resurrection of Christ. That's the gospel. The blood is the death and resurrection of Christ uh, because it was in resurrection that he presented and it was in death that he shed it, right? And it is the blood that has the power to purge our conscience from dead works and from an evil conscience to enjoy and serve the living God. Anyway, um, so the blood is really the qualifier that, and you know, it's interesting, even in James, when he talks about Abraham being justified in Genesis 22, which Paul says, no, he was justified in Genesis 15, when he believed and he didn't have a seed yet, but he believed God's word, uh, you know, before he was circumcised, before anything, before he'd done anything, he believed God and it was reckoned to him for righteousness. That's what Paul says. But James says, no, he was justified in Genesis 22 when he offered, sac uh, you know, um, Isaac on the altar. Fine. But even that, you know, Hebrews gives some more light on that and says that he believed because God had promised that through your seed, uh, I'm going to bless you and your inheritance is all tied up in the seed. He knew that God was promised was so true that if he asked him to sacrifice Isaac, he would have to raise Isaac from the dead to fulfill that promise. In other words, he knew that nothing could separate him from God's promise. God's promise was sure. That's what justified him. Um, and it was related to death and resurrection and bloodshed. And God obviously provides a substitute, which is Christ. That's the faith that justifies Abraham. Even if you look at Genesis 22, it's still, that's the faith. Now, uh... So there's some people that are like Cain and they just deny the blood altogether. But then there's some really good gifted Christians that are genuine believers, I believe, who are kind of getting into the debate and coming from what I call a backloading works perspective, which means, look, when I got saved, I started serving God and I loved God and I've loved God since I got saved. I'm a different person. And so therefore, if you're really saved, yes, faith, faith in the blood and it is salvation by faith alone in Christ alone. But if you're really saved and not just giving lip service, if you really believe, then your life is going to look a certain way. And so what that does is now it gets my eyes off of the bloodshed of Jesus Christ at death and resurrection and onto myself to determine whether or not my faith is just lip service or if it's real saving faith. And the Bible doesn't really distinguish the two. There is just faith. <laughs> and if you have the faith in God's record concerning his son, it shows that you're born again. It shows that you have the witness in yourself it is the spirit that testifies and the spirit is truth and he who believes has the witness in himself that's what uh, first john talks about and loving the brethren is all about recognizing them as the sons of god based on whether or not they have that testimony 
That's what we look to, to determine what someone is saved. And then we determine what to do. So let's say someone's saved, but they're living in sin. Well, first we have to determine if they're saved. And that comes down to what do they believe. If they believe that Jesus died for their sins and rose from the dead for their justification and is God and the Son of Man, you know, the basics of the faith, then they're saved and sealed with the Spirit and they have the Spirit bearing witness that they are a child of God. However, they if they are in sin, then God disciplines everyone that he receives and we can we may have to participate in that discipline like this drummer i had recently i can't work with him because he's a christian and he lives an immoral life now honestly i don't think he's a christian because as i quiz him about what he really believes he's heretical in every area and doesn't understand justification but still i cannot hang out with him because he's going to make my cellist if I rebuke him for his sin in front of the cellist, the cellist thinks I'm religious, and I mean, it's just a bad situation. So, anyway, but that is discipline, where we do not even eat with someone who claims to be a Christian but lives in sin. That's important. Uh, discipline is important. Um, now, what I'll say is that those who are rich have a hard time entering in the kingdom of God, and we think of money, but I say gifting, and I want to tell a little bit of, from my background on this. Um... <sighs> When I got saved, I got saved in a period of revival. I've told the story before, and me and my friend were popular musicians in popular bands, which meant that people respected us and listened to us. I didn't even realize that that's why they were listening to me. I, I, but anyway, I, got, I found myself in a band that became very popular overnight, and all of a sudden everybody knew us and blah, blah, blah. Um, and God gave us a platform to preach the prophetic word at a time when people were hungry for truth in a time of revival in the early 90s. And we saw a lot of people come to the Lord, a lot. And uh, our apartment was open and people came over and studied Daniel and Revelation and all that stuff, you know, and, and, and were convinced that the Lord was coming and they got saved. Um, now, because of that, and we saw miracles, all kinds of stuff. Plus, I had a real dramatic change when I got saved. Some things fell off me. Uh, including pathological lying and lust um, to where I'm in this popular band and I'm telling you that you know we were at this we played at this swanky club and the VIP situation it was just it's kind of insane what was being offered to us and I had no want, desire to be part I was just preaching the gospel all over the place I had zero desire to participate in any of that and that was different for me because I came from a very seedy immoral background that was the washing of the Spirit, the renewing of the Holy Spirit and the washing, and my flesh was put under the power of the cross because I was filled with the Spirit during those early days, and it was a time of revival. Okay, so here's two fatal mistakes I made mentally. Number one, because I was used by the Lord, I thought I was extremely gifted and special. <laughs> and number two, I thought uh, that my flesh had changed i thought that now that i was a believer i would never go back to any evil sinful things and because i was so articulate and kind of gifted i had great pride which blinded me okay and i knew more about the bible after six months of studying with my friend and leading all these people to the lord we went we started going to a church we showed up at a charismatic church with two three rows of people that we'd all led to the lord and we thought we made a splash and i thought i was god's gift to the body of christ this is common i think you know if god uses you this can be a real temptation and because i thought i was god's gift i really couldn't uh receive correction and i didn't understand what the flesh was yet and that meant i was going to go down a long road of difficulty in order for god to get to me and really start dealing with the finer things in my Christian life. Um, but anyway, uh, I thought for the first 10 or 12 or 15 years of my Christian life that every Christian I met was backslidden and lukewarm because they didn't read the Bible the way I did, they didn't know the Bible the way I did, they weren't fervent the way I was fervent, and they weren't pursuing and getting after this thing the way I was. 
and I thought that they meant that that meant that they weren't saved or that they were lukewarm. I had a I despised them. I despised Christians. I had a background of not liking Christians anyway because of my own background, but um, just carried over. And I didn't know that's what I was doing. I would read the Bible and read the Gospels and see the demand that Jesus put. And I saw the life that they lived with Jesus, and I thought that was the model for the Christian life. This discipleship where you follow Jesus around and do greater works than he did, you know, because he went to the Father and raised the dead and healed the sick and preached the Gospel. And, and yet I... I got to a point where I was no longer doing this. See, I didn't see that there was a transition in the Bible even. You know, the three years of ministry of Jesus was a crisis for the lives of everybody who came in contact with him, and it was meant to be. It was a time of uh, bringing great crisis to Israel because their Messiah was here. And... That is not normal. The flesh can't sustain that for 80 years. That was a three-year period of his ministry where his disciples followed him. Then we see in the book of Acts, we see a great outpouring of the Spirit. But within about eight chapters, we see them eventually scattered because of the persecution, and we don't see the dramatic... I mean, God does do dramatic works by the Spirit to raise up prophets and evangelists to establish the uh, gospel in a place and raise up churches. He's done it throughout church history, the Great Awakening, the Welsh Revival. There's been revivals and revivals. Those are sovereign moves of the Spirit that I got saved in one of them. And the problem is, is that you interpret that as the norm, and then you judge everything by it, including your Christian life and other people's Christian lives. And then you... Uh, set yourself up in a, what I call mystical legalism. You know, you measure your Christian life based on whether or not it's like it was in the beginning with all the miracles and everything, especially if you got saved in a time of revival like I did. Okay. Um, but in the book of Acts, what we see is a sort of a disp dissipation of this. And then we start to see, especially in the epistles, the raising up of orderly church lives where people have households and families and children and wives and masters and servants and there's instructions for all of them to have a peaceful and orderly life, which doesn't look at all like the chaos we see in Jesus' ministry and in the early church. Why? You know, what happened? What's different? Well, because there's a life for sustaining the Christian testimony as well called the church life or your daily life that isn't all about revival but about standing as a lampstand and being a normal human being but having the hope of glory and this part I couldn't understand I was a musician who read sci-fi who got saved and then one of the kingdom could come and then I found myself eventually having to deal with the fact that there is still going to be a mundane aspect of my life and I am not equipped for the mundane the daily grind where you get up and you go to work and you come home and you pay your bills and you take care of your family is totally number one alien to me my nature doesn't like it and number two to me in my concept, looks like Laodicea, looks like backslidden, looks like lukewarm, looks like you love the world, okay? And that's how I was for the first 15 years of my life. And, you know, I was so zealous that I was like, I'm going to go find the real church. And I ended up in this Chinese cult, Chinese church that was uh, based on Watchman Nee's ministry, and it was a cult, but it was the most severe demand I could find as far as we had the New Testament practice of the normal church life for the, you know, for the for God's purpose to build up the body of Christ, and we were really doing it. We were really doing it. We were the only church too, in a way. And uh, anybody who was not participating in what waiting, in participating in what we were doing, was not going to be an overcomer, most likely, and would not inherit the kingdom, but would be in outer darkness during the millennium. Uh, saved, yes, but we'd see them in the new Jerusalem because they're not going to get in the kingdom. That's a reward to the overcomers. We're the overcomers. That was us. 
that's the first 15 of years of my life. And now eventually I realized it was a cult and I'm not going to go into all that again, but my whole life fell apart. My marriage fell apart. Everything fell apart when I exited that cult. And I didn't know if I had been deceived for going in or if I was deceived going out. I couldn't tell. I just knew I couldn't take it anymore. I ratcheted up the demand and ratcheted up the demand until I could no longer bear it. I couldn't bear it anymore. And I left. And unfortunately, all of the truths that I knew from the scriptures were so closely uh, mangled with the leaven I had received that I could no longer read the Bible for a long time. So I didn't desire to backslide, but I lost every desire I had no more nothing else I could build and I felt like my house had collapsed and there I was you know and uh, lost my marriage like I said and even then even later when we ended up at a reformed church I ended up at a reformed church with five point Calvinists and to me in my mind they were lukewarm backslidden <laughs> they're the most zealous people around you know but they weren't like what we were doing you know and so I just give you that as a measure of how zealous I had. And that gifting the, of mine, the early gifting, and then setting up the standard and comparing everything to the synoptic gospels and trying to say that that's how we were to live our Christian life made me judge everything in the light of it. And I was wrong. And it blinded me to the sin in my own nature. Now, the first 15 years of my Christian life, that sin was religious. It was the pride I was the rich man who couldn't enter the kingdom of God because I was too loaded with my own gifts. I mean, I was in the kingdom because I believed in Christ. But really, the experience of grace was hidden from me. And uh, I, um, yeah, so anyway, I say all that to say that the next period of my life, the next seven or eight years, was characterized by backsliding, 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 until I was committing sins that I didn't think it was possible for a Christian to commit because my ideology was such that if you're really saved, you're going to have a certain kind of life. And it never occurred to me that I'd be in a situation where I was divorced or in a second marriage or doing some of the other things I did when I was trying to run away from it all because I couldn't approach the Lord anymore confidently because I thought I failed him. And there was no churches that preached grace in my city. And I didn't have YouTube or the internet yet. So I just backslid and backslid until I had nothing left. Hold on a second. Sorry. Um, so anyway, I say all that to say that now I know after the last eight years that my flesh did not change when I got regenerated. It cloaked itself in religious zeal and hid and I thought I was living a righteous life, but actually I, it was repugnant to God. I thought I could really serve and I knew the Bible better than anybody and I could teach and I could blah, blah, blah. You know, I was serving God and all along I wasn't enjoying grace at all. And I was judging everybody thinking that I was one of the few that was actually genuinely saved. And uh, I was measuring all that by my zeal. Well, the flip side of that is that when that whole thing collapses, which God will do in his discipline, he'll let you build something up until he, till he, till you can't take it anymore, and then he'll let it all collapse. Then, what did I do? I had no way to go on, and I just backslid, 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 and I'm talking about like bad backslid, like things that you would say, well, if he's a Christian, there's no way he could do that, and I did, and I'm not proud of it. I, uh, I experienced I felt like how Nebuchadnezzar was sent out to the wilderness like a beast he was like a beast for seven years that's how I felt I couldn't pray you know I felt like I was totally worthless to God and actually part of it was just because I had entered the mundane of taking care of my responsibilities and doing a daily grind and doing a daily job and I it because I had my responsibilities I couldn't read the Bible like I used to I used to read the Bible for four or five hours a day and judge anyone that had kids Anyone who had kids and didn't know the Bible the way I did was clearly caught up in the concerns of this world, you know? <laughs> oh my gosh. And uh, I couldn't, I was of no help to anyone. I thought I was, but I wasn't. I couldn't, nobody was comforted by me, you know? Um, but anyway, because I entered the mundane, 
which was where I needed to be. I needed to be taking care of my responsibilities. It squeezed my time so that I didn't have the hours to mystically pursue the Lord like I used to. And so I felt drier. And I measured myself by that experience and got condemned and thought God had judged me. And that's what eventually, eventually that's, that was during the transition of getting out of the cult. A couple years before getting out of the cult and then leading up to it. I had a job, I was in corporate IT, and I was, you know, I just hated my life, and I hated myself, and I didn't understand it, and thought I'd failed God, and thought I w wasn't living in faith, and all this stuff, because my life didn't look like Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I didn't understand that there is an allowance for the life in, you know, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Philippians. Those people lived orderly lives, and took care of their responsibilities, and that didn't make them enemies of the cross. You know, I've been accused of being an enemy of the cross because I had some concerns in one of my video about my wedding business and the fact that the gay rights thing, they want me to march in their parade or they won't work with me as a vendor. You know, uh, that they said I was an enemy of the cross for having those kind of considerations because we're not supposed to, con we're supposed to hate everything and, and deny ourselves, you know. And I used to think like that. So, you know. It's just amazing. And then so during the time I was totally backslidden, eventually God recovered me and taught me grace. I knew grace for justification, but I did not understand grace for sanctification. I thought sanctification was on us, and I thought my flesh had changed. That was really the, the downfall, the thing that my, my giftedness and my zeal had covered was the fact that my flesh was lurking. And as long as I had religious activities to feed the flesh, I thought I was fine because your conscience doesn't condemn you when you're being religious. It, we, we know, we don't know when we're just being religious. We know when we're being sinful though. So God allowed me to get into just major sin and he was silent the whole time. Um, I cried out to the Lord and it seemed like I just couldn't overcome anything. And there were things that I was addicted to and things that I thought I'd never be able to quit. I thought I was going to eventually have to commit suicide because I was caught up in something that I couldn't get out of and I had no power. And that's when I started getting into Romans six through eight and especially Romans seven and seeing what the law had done to deceive or well, what my sin had done through the law to deceive me and take me captive. And eventually, you know, God unraveled it out. Now, all of this terrible journey I went through, in, I was saved. And there were times when people would say, well, that person's not saved because of the life I was living. But I could not deny that Jesus rose from the dead after dying for my justification, dying for my sins. He rose for, from the dead. That witness was present all the time. But God mercifully let me go through this horrible ordeal because of my pride, my religious seal, my religious pride, and then he had to empty me out to show me, look, the flesh has not changed. You can either believe the gospel and receive the supply of the spirit, or you can walk according to the flesh. And that's what I teach about. I teach the, my job is to teach the Christians who have failed and can't understand why their Christian life is not as good as it used to be. And they can't figure out why they don't have the spirit. And it's because they're looking for the spirit in their religious activity and not in the faith of the facts that are revealed in the New Testament about what God has done for them in Christ. I've seen that faith is a matter not of activity of fervency, but a matter of vision, a vision of your inheritance, a vision of the riches of Christ. And so God has graciously given me a chance to uh, see and I have no way to judge anybody because of where I've come from and I've learned that the spirit is supplied simply by seeing Christ no other way if you get your eyes off Christ and onto your performance you will lose the blessing of the spirit in your experience but you won't know it if you're religiously zealous because your zeal has a fuel that will drive you that you'll think is the Holy Spirit. But the litmus test I've found is, well, what do you think of others? Do you measure others by their testimony or by what you think should be their fruit? And do you judge people who aren't as zealous as you, aren't in the club like you? That is really uh, a warning inside that you're not on the right track. Um, okay, well, I'm going to try to append these and put them up. We'll see if this helps anybody.